Yeah. Guys, nobody's ever heard this before. Nobody's ever seen this. I'm the first one. You are so, you know, honored to be in my presence because I've got this new revelation right. of knowledge. Anytime anybody says that, oh my gosh. Red flag. Red flag. Watch out. Because uh, a famous saying in our movement yeah. uh, that goes like this, uh, if it's true, it's not new. And if it's new, it's probably not true. I think that's a good baseline. Uh, Our goal as Bible teachers is not to, uh, one of my friends puts it this way, we're not the cooks in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. We're the waiter serving up the meal. In other words, it's not our job to go in the kitchen and like cook something up, right? And make something, create something. No, 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 no. It's created. Welcome to Whitefields Community Church Sermon Extra, where we dig deep into this week's sermon. We have been uh, currently moving through the book of 1 Timothy in a series called Equip to Serve. And uh, this week, Pastor Nick taught on uh, chapters, 1 Timothy chapters 4, verses 6 through 16, with a sermon entitled Doctrine and Devotion. It was a really great sermon. And uh, one area that you really emphasized and you started out talking about this is the idea of young people uh, being shamed as Timothy was uh, for their youth. And Paul brings this up and encourages Timothy. Uh, I'd like to share a little bit more about that or dig into a little bit more about that. Yeah, sure. And I I mean, uh, Timothy, I mean, he is in a situation where he had been called to position of leadership as a pastor, as a leader of the church in Ephesus, and he was not being uh, reset, respected or received from uh, by some people who were despising him or looking down on him because of his young age, mm-hmm. uh, which re- really wasn't fair because Timothy had uh, been in ministry for many years working with the Apostle Paul. And yet, you know, these people... First of all, he had been sent there to correct them, and they didn't really think they were wrong. And he had been sent there to make things right that they didn't really want to change. And so he was dealing with pushback, and one of the ways that they were pushing back on him is kind of saying, like, hey, you know, in our culture, which is similar to most cultures, right, um, you should be respecting us. We're the elders. How dare you come in here as a young man and try and tell us older men mm-hmm. what we ought to be doing differently or what we're doing wrong. Right. And Paul told Timothy, hey, I don't, want, I don't want you to give in to that. He says, I want you to teach good doctrine. And he says, I want you to teach these things emphatically. Like, like he says, he literally uses the word command these things here in, verse, in chapter 4. And so, um, you know, I mean, of course, it got me to thinking about uh, myself and ha- having gotten into ministry as a young man. And you know what's, what's interesting? I think that one of the benefits, because I told a story about this guy, and he told me that actually my youth was a benefit. Well, he, he said that, you know, one of my benefits of being young was that I wouldn't rely much on my own experience. Mm -hmm. And I think he was right because you know what that made me do is to say, look, I don't, I'm not going to give you a bunch of like anecdotes about my own life because I don't have anecdotes. Like I've been alive for (laughs) a few minutes, right? Right. right. (laughs) Yeah. But instead, I guess I'm just going to have to lean heavily on what the word of God says and just know that that's what you need. You need the word of God more than you need my stories about what I've done or what I think about things or mm-hmm. my experience. I think that was a huge benefit to me, honestly. And I think it actually served the people who listened to me well. Um, but, you know, I, I was telling you this earlier, and I, I think it's worth noting with the the movie coming out, the Jesus Revolution movie, it tells the history yeah. of the Jesus movement in the 70s and um, 60s and 70s and of course Calvary Chapel being really the tip of the spear for that movement and, and Chuck Smith. So my pastor was a man named Tom Stipe. He was down in uh, Denver. He was from that time. In fact, he was the founder of Maranatha Music. You know, he's just, um, he's a really great man who God used in great ways and used him greatly here in this area as well. Mm-hmm. But uh, Tom, you know, he had been young and he he had been recruited by Calvary Chapel as he started going to the church to become their evangelist. So they would do these concerts on Saturday nights and uh, they'd have all these people come out and then Tom would get up and he'd preach the gospel. That was like his job on staff. Um, And so Tom told me many years later, he said, you know, the genius of Calvary Chapel and Chuck Smith in that movement, the Jesus movement, what made it so special is that Chuck was willing to believe that God could use anybody. 
anybody, right. I- including people who had been formerly drug addicts, people who, you know, looked like dirty hippies because kind of maybe they were. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and young people. Right. Like, I mean, yeah. this is, you know, we talk about Greg Laurie is the one funding this movie. You know, the story with Greg Laurie is that there was an Episcopal church in Riverside, California, which is about a good hour or so from Orange County, which mm-hmm. is where Calvary Chapel was located, still located. And, um, and Lonnie Frisbee, this guy who's mentioned this movie as a hippie evangelist, he had gotten in touch with uh, All Saints Episcopal Church in Riverside. Um, and they were looking for a pastor and they were trying to do some stuff out there. And so they, they got one of the guys from Calvary Chapel, Greg Laurie, to go out there. He was 19 years old. And just well, imagine, like, we're going to send this guy out there. And they gave him the building and they said, Hey, here's a building, you know, do your thing, preach the gospel and, uh, God bless you. I mean, just incredible that you would trust someone who's 19 to do something like that. Mm -hmm. And you're only going to do that if you really believe in the power of God working through ordinary people, like the Acts 4 verse, right? Where it says that the authorities looked upon the disciples and they could see that they were ordinary, untrained men, meaning they weren't a, you know, properly like schooled and stuff like that. Yeah. But it says, but they noticed that they had been with Jesus. And I mean that now that should never be an excuse for saying, um, being dumb is like a virtue that we should try to <laughs> cultivate. Right. <laughs> being dumb is great. Let's yeah, see if we can there, be yeah. dumber. Right. Like, <laughs> um, no, but I mean, being with Jesus is something to cultivate. And if you can add, like it says, uh, second Peter, Peter says in second Peter chapter one, add to your faith virtue and add to Mm. your faith knowledge. So we want to do that. All that to say, I think that we can't get away from that. Like, you know, it's important for me to remember that, that I was at one time 21 years old. I actually started planting the church when I was um, 20 and then officially launched the church when I was 21. Um, But, you know, it's important for me as I get older and for other people get, as they get older, you know, I've noticed this, that as people get, including Chuck Smith, as you get older, you tend to look at other people as being young, but that's right. a moving line, right? Yes. Like I remember uh, Chuck would talk about someone I know who's a pastor and always refer to him as, Oh, well, he's so young. Well, at one point, like when Chuck passed away, this man was like 50 years old. <laughs> he's like, well, no, no, he's actually not yeah, a young not so man. Young anymore. <laughs> Maybe even over the hill a little bit, right? Like, right, right. Um, so, you know, it's important that as we get older, you know, we, we tend to think, oh, well, let's make sure that we don't dismiss the young people in the church um, from serving or despise them in any way because God can and wants to work through them. And our job as we get older mm-hmm. is to encourage them and help them understand that God can and wants to use them too. Yeah. You had something really good to say when we were talking beforehand. Maybe you could yeah. share that. Uh, I don't remember wh- what it was, but... Uh, I'll I, help you. The, no, I think I might. Um, yeah, I think uh, a lot of us have experienced the good and the bad of um, being young. And I think it's great that, you know... Young people have this servant attitude. Uh, not all of them. A lot of young people have a servant attitude that they want to serve, but they may not have that experience. And it's our job to come alongside them and help them and not to discourage them because they are uh, the church. You know, oftentimes people will say, well, they're the future of the church. They're the ones that will be uh, taking this church over someday. And that's not true at all. They are part of the church, just like I am. And we need to help them mature into believers because they are a part of this church right now. And if they want to serve, let's help them. Let's figure out a way to help them serve. And uh, we've, we've both had, and there's plenty of people probably watching that have uh, stepped out in faith and tried to serve when they were young. Mm -hmm. And somebody has tried to uh, discourage them and not purposely oftentimes, it just kind of happens where you're kind of discouraged and um, to step out anyway and say, you know what? God has called me to do this. I'm going to do this. I was 19 years old. My wife, Rosemary, was just reminding me about this the other day Mm because I think that she was... I'm not sure if she was there or if I just told her afterwards, but I was sitting around. I worked at a church in um, Eastern Hungary. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there were like three of us guys who kind of worked at the church and um, we were sitting around 
doing whatever people do at church and uh, talking. That's that's all we really do. If we're not <laughs> preaching, you know, I mean, what do we do? <laughs> yeah. Well, what's funny is that in our church, we actually, we're, we're pretty structured and pretty, yeah. pretty busy. Yeah, we are. In that church, we were not. Like, we were that literally like, well... I guess we're just going to sit here and stare at each other today. <laughs> so it was a much smaller church, and there were a lot of people working there. So yeah. uh, these guys, we were sitting around, two, me and two other guys, and um, I don't know, somehow it came up, and I told them that I'm going to go, I'm going to plant a church in, in Eger. Now, I didn't plant the church till like two years later, but I knew that God was calling me at that time to do it. And that one guy laughed out loud and literally like pointed at me and like grabbed his <laughs> chest. Like that's how he's like, oh, really? Okay. I mean, really just like full on like it was mock, a hearty laugh. I mean, he was mocking me. Yeah. Oh, no. And, uh, you know, I mean, it didn't perturb me. Uh, but what's really funny is then later on, he came back to me and said, Hey, I read this verse in first Timothy chapter four, verse 12, and you, you should think about it. And then he apologized. And I'm like, well, I've been thinking about that verse like every day of my life since I've been working at this church, because that verse, it's like my life verse, man. Like that's, that's what I've got to guide me as a young person. But you know what? I don't think it's limited to young people. Like I said on Sunday, cause somebody might listen to this and they might say, well, I'm not young. Well, Hey, you know what? This applies to you because Everybody. there are always barriers. There are cultural barriers, age barriers. Maybe somebody doesn't want to listen to you. Maybe they're despising you because you're older. Yeah. That happens in our culture all the time. Absolutely. And so what can you do? Well, yeah. set an example in conduct, in speech, in faith, in love, in purity, those five things. And as you do that, what do you do? You give credence to your words, mm-hmm. and um, you show that you're not just somebody who talks a good talk. You're somebody who believes this and lives it out. And rather than building new barriers that people have to get over in order to believe, you're removing any unnecessary barriers yeah. so that it's easier to believe. Yeah. And hey, if you're watching, uh, smash that, uh, well, of course you're watching, you're here. Smash that like button, hit the subscribe button. It really helps with the uh, algorithms. But uh, I think one of the great uh, uh Great examples in my life of that happening is when uh, I first showed up at this Bible camp, I wanted to serve because they had an opening. My youth pastor said, why don't you go? Because he knew I wanted to serve in some way. I had never served in anything. And uh, he sent me up there and I was young. I think I was uh, like 15 at the time. And uh, they looked at me and I remember the camp director looked at me and said, you, they sent you. And, you know, I was young and experienced and, and he was kind of right in a way of, uh, I have no experience, but uh, he ended up using me just because I was there and I wasn't going to leave because I wanted to serve. And um, it took about a, uh, a year for me to really, uh, for, him, for me to convince him that I was there to serve. I was there because God wanted me to. And I was going to do uh, whatever it took to show these people that I wanted to serve the Lord. And it didn't matter how young I was. And I remember the next year uh, I was helping uh, a college uh, lady to uh, gather these two churches and we were going to do one Bible study for the youth. And I was 16 at the time, so I was I was able to drive up there. And um, I uh, she was only able to do it for about a month and she, uh, other obligations, she wasn't able to do it. So I kept doing it. And he actually, the, the director of the camp discovered that I was still doing it six months later. And he was dumbfounded mm. that a youth, some, my own, I was really basically leading my own peers in a youth group. And he was dumbfounded because I did exactly what you were saying. I, I was there to teach the word, and I was there to serve any way that the Lord would have me. And yeah, I was an experience. Yeah, I probably didn't know very much, but I was there, and I was available for the Lord to use. And it really changed his mind. And he, mm. he, I, I worked with him actually for about nine years after that in, in different ministries. Yeah. So that's cool. All right, switch gears. Yeah. Now let's talk about this. Paul says there in, I was at verse seven. He says, that's right. On the one hand, he says, I want you to um, train yourself in good doctrines and mm-hmm. the words of the faith. 
Yeah. Also the word nourish. I want you to nourish yourself and nourish others, right? Nourished mm -hmm. in the good words of, or in the words of the faith, which is the scriptures. But yeah. then he says, have nothing to do with irreverent myths and silly myths. Silly myths. Irreverent, yeah. silly myths. Okay. Art, do you think there are any irreverent, silly myths <laughs> that people get into today? You oh don't have goodness. to name too many names. Yeah, that's... Or, you know what I'm saying? I'm just saying, like, right. do they exist? How Absolutely. do you know? Because here's the thing, right? Like, how do you know if what you're getting into it counts as an irreverent, silly myth? Yeah. I, I think there's countless irreverent, <clears throat> silly myths that we hear nowadays that I've even heard preached, not you, but other pastors preach from the pulpit. And, you know, one comes to mind is... Uh, that it's easier for a camel to fit through the eye of the needle than it is for a rich man to uh, get into heaven. And uh, I heard somebody preach that, well, the eye of the needle is actually a location where a camel had to go and they would kneel and then they would kind of fit the camel through and, and uh, this is a real location. It's a, it's a myth, it's not real. It's a, you know, it's a, a Christian myth that's propagated. Yeah. that uh, we often, and, and I'm sure you've heard of some, but. Yeah, I've heard of a ton. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I would just say like, um, you know, sometimes if it's, I think some of these can be pretty benign, right? Yeah. Like, okay. Most so, okay. Yeah. So sometimes people, you know, there's, there's some kind of myth that goes around that's not true. Mm -hmm. I think when we're talking about irreverent and silly myths, yeah. um, and, you know, at the end, if you look at the end of First uh, Timothy, there at the end of chapter 6, he repeats it again. And he says, he says, avoid irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. So what he's talking about is that these people are going around yeah. teaching things that, first of all, were not true. Mm -hmm. Right. And their things generally, he mentions in chapter one, they had to do with like Jewish genealogies and mm -hmm. it's kind of like hidden mystic knowledge that people were claiming that they had. And he's saying, no, 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 just stick to the scriptures, man. The scriptures have everything yeah. we need, as, as Peter says, for life and godliness. Um, and so, you know, you don't need to get off into all these things. I, I've noticed that this is what people do. My opinion is that some people, it's almost like they haven't been taught or learned how great the scriptures are and what a treasure God has given us in them. And almost like, I, I've literally heard people say this. Well, if you just like, like people, the, people find the Bible boring. Mm -hmm. So what you should do is, you know, find something interesting. And so some people yeah. go on this quest to find something interesting or novel. Yeah. Guys, nobody's ever heard this before. Nobody's ever seen this. I'm the first one. You are so, you know, honored to be in my presence because I've got this new revelation right. of knowledge. Anytime anybody says that, oh my gosh. Red flag. Red flag. Watch out. Because uh, the famous saying in our movement yeah. uh, that goes like this, uh, if it's true, it's not new. And if it's new, it's probably not true. Yeah. I think that's a good baseline. Uh, our goal as Bible teachers is not to, uh, one of my friends puts it this way, we're not the cooks in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. We're the waiter serving up the meal. In other words, yeah. it's not our job to go in the kitchen and like cook something up, right? And make something, create something. No, 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 no. It's created. Our job is to yeah. serve it, right? Present it in a way that shows how good it is yeah. and helps you to consume it and apply it and all those things. Like yeah. he said, what does he say here? The three elements of a sermon, public reading of scripture, mm -hmm. explanation, exhortation. There you go. That's it. I mean, you know what? Simple. Um, it, you guys can do that. You know, it's simple yet profound. You can teach somebody the Bible. You can teach it to your kids. You can teach yeah. it to your neighbors. You can teach these words because we believe in something called the perspicuity of scripture, which mm. means that scripture is given to us by God in a way that is clear and understandable. Now, not everything is equally clear and understandable. Like that word. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Which is not in the Bible. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. But the point is that, um, yeah, God's word. And that, that was also part of the genius of Calvary Chapel that we were instilled with, is that the word of God is accessible. Mm -hmm. Read it publicly, explain it, apply it. That's all this is, right? That's all that's needed. Yeah. Okay. So just saying, uh, 
irreverent, silly myths. Yes, sometimes like people are always looking for this, you know, it's almost like they're looking for this mystical key. Well, what's yeah. the key that will unlock this thing that God wants to do in your life? You know, it's almost like they're always looking for the shortcuts. Kind of like all these people, you know, advertising, you know, get rich quick schemes or lose weight quick schemes. Sometimes people are the same yeah. way with their spirituality and they're looking for some kind of like secret thing that's going to do something magical. But look, mm -hmm. God's given us what we need in the scriptures. They need to be understood. They need to be applied. We need the power of the spirit. God has given us everything we need for life and godliness here. And so we want to stick to the scriptures, following the leading of the Holy Spirit. And, and I think that's it. So we don't want to get off into uh, weird stories that, you know what I mean? Like that aren't yeah. true. That we're so gravitated to. We just yeah. want to hear them and eat them up. We want something that's going to blow our minds all the yeah. time. We yeah. live in that kind of culture. Blow my mind, you know? Um, yeah. And we can get off base doing that. Yeah. And so we want to stick to the scriptures. Absolutely. And I think that's rule to live by. Stick to the scripture. Well, we are so happy that you have joined us here. Make sure that you hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, and uh, catch us wherever podcasts are not sold, but listened to. Yeah, so, given away for given free. Given away for free. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we will see you next week.